Uh, most of you, not all of you, but around the room, but uh, we're going to give you uh, an official welcome to this brief, brief, briefing, which is coaching the plateaued performer. Uh, I'm John Lena, the director of performance consulting here at Psych Associates, and along with uh, Joe Lamantia, we're going to be kind of sharing some thoughts with you, at least our experiences, in looking at uh, a topic that's uh, pretty challenging nowadays, and working with those people that for some reason, we're at the working at the same level. Um, there are uh, maybe some housekeeping things we should do before we get going. Um, first off, some of you I know are familiar with Psych Associates. Some of you are even our, our customers. But for those of you who really don't know much about us, maybe this is your first exposure to us. Uh, <coughs> what do we do? No, we uh, uh, we are a performance improvement consultancy, and basically what it does. Is what that means is that we help businesses improve productivity really through a couple dimensions, both with helping them with people decisions and with people development. We help organizations make uh, very good, smart decisions as to who should be in what positions and doing what roles. At the same time, we help businesses really improve and optimize performance through training and development as well. In front of you, there's a great packet um, which has uh, kind of an overview, the more detailed overview is how we help organizations with uh, uh, build high performance within their, within their business. Today's uh, briefing is going to be just that. We've got about an hour of your time. Uh, we've done these uh, uh, periodically during the course of the year. We've got another one scheduled in the area of sales coming up in September uh, on negotiating. Uh, you all have received information on this briefing, you'll receive information announcing that one as well. Also in that packet, there's some information um, about Joe and myself. Uh, it's several hundred pages, but uh, it's interesting, like reading. There's also information as to some of the work we've done and work, who we work with. There's also uh, a certificate in an envelope like this. And it's uh, a way in which we would like to share our appreciation for your getting up extra early and joining us this morning. It's a uh, two-for-one certificate which allows you to send two people from your organization to an upcoming dimensional selling workshop. Uh, the tuition for that is $1,800. As a thank you to you, you may be able to send two people for the price of two, uh, for the price of one. <laughs> the price of three. <laughs> Uh, later on when we came in, some of you gave us your uh, business cards as well, and we're also going to have a drawing for a free seat in that same uh, workshop. Dimensional selling, uh, we conduct that workshop on an open basis about three or four times a year. And as I mentioned, the next one is June 10th coming up. Pam, you have a thought? Um, for anyone that did not get that envelope because uh, your packet was prepared a little bit later this morning. If you'll just make sure I get your name, uh, we'll send you your the, the two for one. The, our thank you to uh, to you. Thanks, ma'am. Also in the back, there's uh, in that packet there's a feedback sheet. Those of you that are familiar with Psychological Associates know that we are intense lovers of insights and impressions and your feedback as to what you got out of this workshop, what you'd like to see changed. Uh, areas you'd like to have more information on. It greatly helps us make sure that we can directly <coughs> pinpoint future uh, presentations so that they're in line with what you'd like to have. There's also, by the way, a copy of the presentation that we're going to be giving with you today. So there's no need to take notes and, and everything comes out as far as what's up here. You can just take notes right there on the, on the packets. Uh, with that, we'd like to... Uh, hi, come on in. Tell us who you are and what you do for a living, your favorite color. Oh, no. <laughs> um, before we get into uh, what coaching is all about, we thought we'd start off on the right foot by maybe taking a look at the top five reasons how you can tell that your manager is not an effective coach. We did have ten, but we didn't want you to become unconscious with laughter, so we just limited it down to uh, five here. Number five. When traveling with salesperson, insists on wearing his "I'm with stupid" T-shirt. <laughs> Number four, opens every performance review with a Miranda re Miranda warning. Number three, 
and can tell you, ah, third way. Gives employees feedback using his Freddie the Coach sock puppet. Number two, when you call his office, you're told you're on his no-call list. And the number one way you can tell that your manager is not an effective coach, he gets each performance review by slipping on a circuit for the box. Like I said, we wanted to give you some light levity. We didn't want you <laughs> on the floor. Actually, when we have done these before, and uh, afterwards, we've had uh, several people come up to us and say, you know what, I've uh, actually had some coaching situations that weren't all that far from that. But before we get into uh, really looking at what coaching, especially working with plateaued performance is all about, we'd like to first, just I'll just throw this out to the group and nothing formal, but like to get your impressions as to why you're here. What, what was it about what we sent to you and what this issue is interesting to you? Just anyone. Anyway. When you first get into the selling, everybody's excited and they go out and cold call and do all this fun stuff and then they kind of make their sales and just kind of ride along with the wave. And it, trying to keep that enthusiasm and excitement and effective coaching is a hard skill to overcome. So I just think it's interesting to see what you have to say about that. It's a fast start. All and of a sudden you realize it's not quite as romantic as I thought it was. The brochures wasn't as much rain in this area as I thought there was. Okay. Other reasons? I think that the word plateau, what we had mean, I think that there's people in our organization that have just hit this level and they're, you know, they're just kind of skating along and they're just not taking it up up the notch that they need to. So, that's the suggestion. so you feel maybe the potential might be there, but potential whatever is there, but for whatever, whatever reason, reason is there. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts on plateauing, why you're here? I think they have a level of satisfaction, kind of a temporary level of satisfaction, and it's difficult to get them to sit down and consider what else they might be missing. Okay, so it's been comfortable. You know, they kind of like it where they are. What does plateau performance though really mean to your organization? What kind of impacts do they have on your business? I think you're not maximizing each region or territory responsibility that you have. I think what you find out, what the challenge that we face is that we find people going to a group of customers over and over and they're really not we're not seeing the market clearly because they don't feel challenged to go out and see more opportunities okay. actually don't pursue what they could be able to go after other thoughts they could create a ceiling um, for your newer people so i think it affects the newer people dramatically mm -hmm. now that it, it's a not really a ceiling, but everybody sees that that's the expectation level, so if they get there, they're going to make it. They might see their senior performers, people with tenure, hitting that same ceiling, and why should I be going any higher? Yeah. A lot of reasons, a lot of uh, drive and initiatives as to why people plateau and for whatever reasons. However, it is an issue, especially those of us in sales. How many sales managers do we have? Those of us in sales know exactly what it feels like. Not actually, 99% in our business careers, 99% of our time, or 99% of us will at one point in time have plateaued in our jobs during the course of our careers. So it's not something that's too foreign, but it's also something that uh, has perspective of not being too attractive. What we're going to be doing today is talking about coaching. We're going to be talking about platforming performance what that is, why it occurs, and we're going to give you some solutions as to what you can do about it. Number one, we thought we'd start out with, let's put a stake in the ground, get some insights as to, first off, what are we really looking at when we use the word coaching? A very popular word nowadays. And we'd like to be able to say that, for the most part, it's a structured process for developing knowledge, skills, and specific behaviors with others. Key in here is structure. Effective coaching is much more than just talking. It's a very focused or structured, structured process. Outcome is that of taking, as Kevin had put it, let's take him to the next level. We're bumping our head on the ceiling. Perception with plateau performance is there should be much more that can be gained from that. How do we go about doing it? We look at coaching, effective coaching, 
as having a balance, a balance in two areas. We refer to those as being results area and another one being uh, relationship. This magnificent piece of artwork proves the point I was trying to talk about. If you take a, a matrix where on one side you've got results, on the other side you've got establishing relationships, low, high performance. What if you've got a, uh, a manager who coaches in a way that is very, very high on results, but maybe not very high on establishing relationships? Well, we've all been salespeople, most of us are sales managers. What kind of results, what kind of outcomes would spin out from a manager who concentrates and works in that way? High turnover. High turnover? Short term, rather than long term view? Yeah, short term gain, numbers might be there. In the long term, what might spin out from that? What could spin out from this regarding retention? You lose salespeople, you lose customers. Salespeople, the other part about it, right, Joe, is that of customers as well. On the other hand, if you're looking at a perspective where a manager is very high on relationships, very concerned with it, but low on getting results, what can spin out from that? You don't see the growth in the Growth may not be, potential may not be there. In defining yourself, do you sell people on a very subjective basis? Oh, he's a great guy, he has a lot of great relationships, but in fact he's not impacting the business the way he should be. Right, right. We talked about structure before. A very unstructured process could be a, could be a possibility that might spin out from this. What would this what would be what would happen if you have a very high performing, very high demanding salesperson and you have one that's not very a manager that doesn't push results as much? What could be the outcome from that? Here's someone who does her job very well, at the same time doesn't feel challenged could be a retention issue as well. It might get burned out on one side, it might get complacency in here. So the point we're trying to make though is that in looking at coaching, you need to look at it from a balance from both perspectives. And it's not just a pure balance that would be right here. It really depends on where that salesperson is in their line of development. Ideally, the outcome from effective coaching is a win-win for everyone, for the organization, as well as a salesperson, as well as your customers. Okay, that's a kind of an overview on coaching. When we're looking at plateauing. Again, that's a description of that. In sales, as you've heard him all have said, it's more or less you see people at the same performance level. Could be average performance, could be low performance, could be also high performance. Just want to establish that plateauing can mean a number of things. Perception, though, by management is that it's not productive. There's not movement. Something is not occurring. Management is looking for change, new goals, new dimensions, new strides, new objectives. You want to go in different directions. If it's not moving, it can't be good. So the overall action that feels it needs to occur is that something needs to move. Something needs to change from that. So there's some getting at is that there's some, in general, in business, there's some real doubts that plateau performance, there's really very many pluses with it. In fact, let's take a look at some of the downsides that can spin out from this. First off to the organization, unmet growth goals. I don't know about the sales managers are here, but I don't know if there have been many meetings where sales managers have said, you know what, folks, I'm completely satisfied with our level of performance. I don't want us to do any more or any, any less. I'd like you to stay right here. <laughs> It just doesn't happen. It's just not in the cut of what, what spins out from that. Loss of market share or performance. You know, what do stock analysts feel about organizations that aren't moving forward with it? Okay, some real definite downsides if your organization is not keeping up. Downside of, 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 of plateau performance. Excessive costs. What kind of excessive costs could occur? Some of you have mentioned that you've had plateau performers. What kind of excessive costs have you run into? Base salary keeps growing even though they're not contributing. Your base salary continues to grow, Joe. Did you hear that one? Their base salary continues to grow. <laughs> so, base, so, and costs for that. 
what other kind of costs would you run into? If for some reason, uh, maybe retention issues, whether it's proactive or reactive retention. You have to go out as recruiting costs, retraining costs. You may even have to do things in your business that are outside the area of sales. You have to increase your advertising, your marketing may have to be a little different, your packaging may have to change. So there's some real downsides that could spin out from that. There's also downsides to the salesperson. Now the loss of tangible gains, in spite of maybe around a situation where their, their base salary may be going up, there's a lot of situations where that base salary doesn't change, or they may not even be a base salary. So in essence, there could be some tangible rewards. But what about the intangibles? What kind of intangible rewards would not be met if someone's a plateaued performer? Sense of accomplishment, pride of accomplishment. Okay, they they feel that they're not fulfilling their their own needs. Maybe self fulfillment. Sure. What else? Motivation. Some internal motivation drive to be able to get them going. <coughs> They may also be dissatisfied with opportunities. With organizations becoming flatter and flatter in the way in which they're structured, there's fewer and fewer opportunities. There's fewer sales managers. Maybe there's fewer national managers. Maybe they may also have an opportunity if they plateau, they may also even lose part of their territory. And as a result of that, as somebody said that earlier, some demotivation, complacency, may substitute their level of competency. They may even have resentment toward the organization. Why would they be blaming the organization if they're a plateau performer? Good thing the organization's not giving them the tools that they need to grow. Okay. Maybe some barriers impeding their capability of being able to do things. Other thoughts? So, what if this person has that resentment and is a high performer? Those types of folks are catnip for recruiters and your competition. These are the people that are routinely doing their job, but for whatever reason, they feel that the organization is not helping, as Mark had mentioned, helping them grow and advance. Now, what about the upsides? Can someone be a plateau performer and still be successful? Sales managers, who has a plateau performer that they feel pretty good about? I have one. Get the trick question. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I have one that manages our largest account, which we have a great relationship with. But there's definitely upside potential, but it's one of those comfort level things. It's comfort with the current brands, the current buyers, the current categories. Um, you know, her perception perception is everything's fine, but the reality is it could be so much better. Okay. Let's take a look at maybe some of those piggybacking on what Kevin was talking about. To the organization and the salesperson, there could be some upside to the plateau. First off, predictable performance. I mean, if you think of you sales managers, if you had a corral of maxed out, high potential salespeople that regularly hit great numbers. It may not be the goals that they hit, but they hit some pretty good numbers. What does that do to your forecasting? It helps with accuracy with that. And many times, those are the salespeople that when your business is down because of that plateau performance, they carry a share of the load. Many times it's often a sign of competence and success. A person does have capability, but maybe if there's challenges were different, opportunities were different, piggybacking, uh, Mark, on what you're saying, conditions were appropriate, that in and of itself could be even greater than what it is. So there's some upsides and downsides to that. What we want to be looking at now is we've, we've established what coaching is all about, <clears throat> what it's supposed to do, maybe starting to think about plateauing as to how it impacts us. But why does it happen? What occurs? Just in talking to people as we came in, there are different reasons about plateauing.
we've got some good ones out here. <clears throat> There's a number of reasons, but for, for the most part, they fall into three camps. Organizational issues, motivational issues, and ability issues. From the organizational part of me, it might be the way the organization is set up. You know, the way they process uh, orders the same way, they have the same reporting relationship. Nothing has really changed over the last 20 years, except the expectations of the salespeople, for some reason, is that it has to be changed and you need to have credit performance. It could be their selection process. Are they getting the right people in the right spots doing the right things? What's more, do those people fit the culture within which they are going to need to be successful? Product quality mix may not be, may not have changed, or may not be keeping up with the market. The comp plan may stink. They may feel that there's no way that in which I can do any more than I'm doing that will take me above and beyond. My intangible rewards won't net. Competition could also be a factor. We're not keeping up with uh, our market shares, not keeping up, or our products or services are not in line with the competition. Even leadership. People like to work for people that inspire them and help them feel better than they like to work for. Them. This person is a bozo or just flaky or unfocused. These are all things that could have a very positive effect on how well that salesperson is performing. And in essence, could be a really strong indicator for why they're plateauing. The thing about it is, there's very little control that they have on this. So all external to the salesperson. Another reason might be motivational issues. As someone mentioned, I've got said it, I like where I am. I feel very comfortable. And that's what's more, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I haven't heard anything different. They may have lost the passion, the, the drive behind it. For the most part, though, they feel pretty good about what they're doing. Today also, more than ever, I guess since spinning out from results from 9-11, is really looking at people or looking at a life-work balance in what I'm doing in concert with what I'd like to be able to achieve personally. There's also tangible and intangible benefits. If I don't see those as being able to be achieved or reached, why, do, why should I do more than what I'm doing? Consequently, also goals and aspirations that are given to them, if they're one-way goals, they have no involvement, that in themselves could be defeating in itself. Now, interesting about this is that, for the most part, a lot of that is internal to the salesperson. There may be some things that they can do about them. There may be some other things that they cannot do. The third area for why people plateau is that of the ability. Potential. They may just not have the horsepower. They may just not be able to do it. Or worse, they may be able to do it, but it's not recognized, either by the organization or by them. Sometimes with salespeople, it takes time. It takes maturity. You know, not everyone goes from the minor leagues to the majors uh, immediately. It takes time. A good wine does not all mature at the same level. Same thing with salespeople. It could also be a training or maybe even a feedback issue. They think they're doing fine. Maybe they, maybe they aren't getting the training they need. Maybe they aren't getting the feedback they, they need to have. Maybe they don't even know that they're plateauing. To them, they feel they're doing pretty well. Do they really understand what's expected of them? Have they been told the feedback? Many times when we do these workshops, I'll say, how many people here have a plateau performer? They raise their hand. How long have they been a plateau performer? This guy's been a plateau performer for two years. Why? And then they start to squirm. Why haven't you done something about it? Well, I talk to him, but it's, I really don't know how to approach him. He's not all that. So there's always a reason for it. The issue about ability is that it's very internal to the salesperson. They have a lot of control, the salesperson or the sales manager, in coaching that performance. Where we're going with this and setting it up is that, let's face it, in looking at plateaued performance, there are going to be those things that are do something about as a sales manager fairly quickly, we say are coachable, but there are just some things that aren't coachable. Those organizational pieces that I talk about, <coughs> for the most part, are not going to happen in a short period of time. There's even things on the motivational side that 
really aren't coachable. They need more counseling. For di to differentiate, we envision counseling as being things that address ability or willingness, whereas coaching addresses skill development. On the other side of the fence, those things that we see that are coachable are certainly their ability and performance of being in how they open a sales call, how they involve the customer. Those are skills and competencies that can be addressed. Interestingly enough, there are those things that are also motivational issues, but are very coachable. What kind of involvement do they get in setting objectives? Do they partner with your boss? How are they treated? And do they are they comforted with that process. What we try to set up the first part of the briefing then is before you determine that this person needs coaching, first determine what is causing that plateau of performance. It could be some things you control, it could be some things you can't control. In that aspect, we're going to shift gears <clears throat> and take a look when it is something that you can control, what can you do about it? How can you coach, actually coach those abilities and motivational issues through plateau? To effective coaching. With that, I'm going to turn it over to probably the best looking and most astute person I know, my boss, Joe Lamontino. I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Um, I'm kind of twist the prison and stay out of the light. Uh, first of all, let's look at what we're dealing with today, and it's called uh, plateau performance. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, to ask you. That seems like a static term. Uh, have, has your business changed? Has the business changed in the last few years at all? Yes. Well, is there something in kind of with, with, with uh, standards of performance that haven't changed also? Because often with the business cycle and with businesses, things change drastically, especially in today's marketplace. And it's just possible that the expectations of your performers or the identification of what they need to do hasn't changed. And so they basically don't know what to do. But they feel very comfortable with the annuity that they've built up uh, if the comp plan works that way. They feel very comfortable uh, with the fact that they know how to handle internal resources, uh, that they know the job, that they know the territory. And as a result of that, uh, they kind of just go on with what they've done before. They receive recognition, especially if they're making a certain amount of money. But you really haven't identified um, where they need to go. There's always a gap if the organization is changing between what you have in place and things that you need to put in place. So that's one thing to think of. Another thing is what excites them. Things that excited them earlier may not excite them anymore. Uh, how do you clarify the aspirations? Are the aspirations of the company different than the aspirations of your salespeople? plateau performance. What are their aspirations? Is, is it still intang or tangible? Are they looking primarily to make more money? Is that their scorecard? Or are they looking for something else at this particular point? Ask yourself. You've been at what you're doing for a long time. What excites you? So I guess we get back to what is a plateau performer? Uh, is it somebody that's been around, that's experienced, that's uh, bringing in revenues that the company say says uh, needs to be meet, meeting the quota that's been established? Is it somebody that uh, is comfortable with what was, but may not be comfortable with what is, and therefore cannot move ahead? Those are things for you to find out. Uh, I'm supposed to present how we go about coaching. Uh, and I think that's an important issue. Right now, coaching is probably one of the number one uh, skills in the entire nation, whether it be in sales or whether it be in management that companies are focusing on. Uh, 
they're spending a tremendous amount of dollars uh, trying to get better performance out of their people. How do I do this? This was uh, another part that I was going to mention. Oh, there we go. Uh, sorry about that, Joe. Uh, another way of looking at what's coachable is not coachable is if you look at a, a matrix where there's ability, low and high, and willingness, you can start taking a look at if you have someone that certainly has the ability, for whatever the reason, is not willing to do it, that's where you're going to spend more time in counseling them. Those that are pretty good performers, Ted Williams, you know, he didn't spend much time with the batting instructor, but they collaborated a lot. And if someone is not having the ability or has the willingness, you need to make some decisions as to what to do with them. Do they stay where they are? Do they leave the organization or do they move into some other area? And this is the area we're talking about are those people that first off have that willingness and have the potential to do more. All right, we, in, in, in dealing with coaching, whether it be in a formal presentation, getting a group of pe uh, people together, or whether it be sitting down on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, see coaching as a process in three, three, three different parts. Uh, planning, observing, and giving feedback. Now, within each one of those parts, there's some skills that need to be determined. Uh, planning, for example, uh, has three objectives. One of which is sizing up the skill proficiency. But there has to be something that comes before that. What do you need before you can size up the skill proficiency? Who can tell me? But you have to define the, uh, okay, Joe. Define the end result, define the, the goal. Now you have to define the goal, you have to actually define the skills. What are the skills that you're, you've identified that need to be changed. If you have a plateaued performer, there you get into what are the changes needed for the new aspirations maybe within the company. And you need to look at the skills that are manifested by this high performer and say where does he or she have to go to meet the new plateau. Uh, we often go into an organization and create a process called profiling and we try to drain out or identify the characteristics for success. Now we can do that in a static way, which says, how could, what are the characteristics that, based on the present operations of the company, uh, would mean success? Or we can do it predicting some future growth and some changes within the, in, in the organization. And if we do that, we put that into the mix and come up or try to identify characteristics of top performers and we compare them with marginal performers. And so we come out with a template of what skills would be needed to succeed within this framework. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Whatever way you at attempt to do it, the key foundation that you have to have is an identification of what will spell success. Now you can go back and be very basic. Go back to things that were identified back in the 1920s as far as best practices. You can go back and say that probing skills are critical to develop relationships. Therefore, I need to identify that as one of the skills I need to observe. Or you can say that the person needs to be structured in the interaction that they have, and therefore, that's one thing I want to observe. Anything that you set up as a clear indicator, a sales indicator of success, has to be observable. How many in here have set up observables uh, for their coaching? When I say observables, I mean sales indicators. You can do one of two things. You can say at the end of a quarter, you haven't made your quota, what's going on? Sit down and try to counsel. Or you can have certain sales indicators you have in place and say, if they do these indicators, they're going to meet the quota and go beyond. It's a, different, it's, it's, it's a different approach. Motivational aspect, I'll turn to my two 
directors and leaders of motivation over here on the right, Rhonda and Susan, and say that motivation is a critical thing. But motivation is also driven by process. If the process isn't there, if the uh, indicators are not identified, then the motivation can founder because there's no direction for the effort. So agree on the expectations, the set one. So you have to set up the expectations, then you have to agree on them, which means um, there's always that debate whether something's fair or not. And I think within the context of is it fair for the organization, does it meet the needs of the organization, and does it meet the needs of the individual? Does it excite them or de-excite them in what they're going to have to do? Those are the kind of conversations you really have to have when you're setting up expectations. And you have to really uh, learn to size up the behavior and link it, link it with uh, a motivation and individual needs, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. And establish an action plan for developing the skill and get buy-in from the person you're coaching to that action plan. So if you think of those three things, make sure you have the indicators well-defined. Make sure that the person that you're coaching agrees on what's expected, not just a quota. And number three, uh, establish a plan that is specific enough so that the particular uh, person you're coaching can succeed. And there's no confusion and ambiguity and debate at the end of the day on whether or not they succeed. One of the elements with coaching, another coaching, is in the developing your observations and laying out these indicators. You have to look at salespeople as having different experience levels. Uh, and experience level doesn't necessarily tie into proficiency, it should. But what you have to do is say, where is this person now on this continuum? Is the person a beginner? Is the person sort of in the middle range? Or is the person an expert? If the person's an expert, somebody that you can rely on, and in this case, John's a good example of that, uh, uh, John, I don't, I, there's no way of directing John. I have to collaborate with John. My role with John is to kind of remove his barriers and try to fathom what excites him. What do you think excites John? <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> but uh, the idea of collaborating with somebody that has the knowledge and then talking and discussing those issues that seem to be barriers to move ahead and go beyond where the person was before. And again, getting back to that, is the narrow the skills that are needed by a, quote, salesperson is, are much fewer and more specific with the high performer. You're really going to lock into what those are. I mean, it might be that the person's gotten used to uh, to the customers and the clients so the relationships are way up here but at the same time if the person has accountability for new business the new business is not going too well. The revenues are still there but the new business is not going too well. How can you talk about that without tying it into the organizational uh, aspirations? You can't. So you, there's a balance there. Uh, it could be that annuities build up. I mentioned this. Sometimes it's very difficult when you're looking at job performance to say who the great water walkers, the great salespeople are, because through the process, some of them have gotten into positions and received accounts and other things that make a difference. And if you don't have those sales indicators really identified, when you're doing your evaluation, you're going to be confused yourself as you try to coach. The intermediate, of course, is like a bell curve. That's where you're, that's your C. That's the area where you don't want them to go lower, but you do want them to go higher. And so there is a sort of uh, uh, expected performance 
that might be placed in the middle section. The beginners, they have a lag time. You're trying to get them up to speed. You have to identify the basic skills, some of the ones that I mentioned before. Maybe managing object, objections, managing resistance, uh, structured, structuring their calls, planning their calls, identifying their targets, uh, territory management, on and on and on. Those are things that are sort of just criteria for moving up to the intermediate level. And then once those are in play, it's like the golfer. I heard Jerry over there talking about golf. And it's like the golfer. I mean, I go to, with a professional out in Fresno once a year or once every year. It has improved my game a little bit, a little bit. But there's a big difference between what he's showing me there and then me going and doing it afterwards. And it's very, very important uh, that uh, the beginner, you see progress. Everybody knows about a pipeline. Pipeline starts with a suspect and ends with a client. And there's commitments made throughout that process to get to that stage. Well, in a sense, a salesperson, a beginner begins here, and it's your job to identify those commitment levels that are needed and also those skill levels that are needed to move them through to reach that, those other stages. There's your three possibilities, of course, if you get them to the middle level, and that is they can slide, they can stall, or they can grow. Now, the question that you have personally, if you are a manager of these people, is where do I spend my time? Because many people find out that they spend too much time on the first level and not enough time on some of the other levels. Do you spend most of your time with people who are bringing in the most money? You would think because they're experienced you don't have to spend much time with them. Or do you spend most of your time with the beginners? Or do you spend most of your time with the poor performers? And then you get into something else. Because you have plateaued performers, but then you've got poor performers. Where do you spend your time? It's always, it's always easy to spend your time, in a sense, with the people that you think need it most, which would be the poor, poor performer. But statistics show that that's not the best use of your time for increasing revenue. The objectives of observing. So we talked about planning, and I talked about sales indicators, I talked about organizational aspirations, individual aspirations. Well, and I talked about developing, uh, putting people on this continuum, coaching continuum, and then you lay out the skills that are needed according to the level that they're on and coach to those. If it becomes a counseling, as John has brought up, that's something totally different. Counseling is going to take a long time. We might call that a long coaching cycle. And it's something, if it's attitude, if it's behavioral, something you're going to have to really work with. And then you'll have to say, well, is, is, uh, is that a good use of my time? How much am I vested into this? How much do I need to do? Do I have enough time to do it? In the object objectives of observing, I've already mentioned most of them, know what to look for. If there's one thing that you could take out of this session that would help all of you is go back and say, do I know, if I were sitting down with a person, Am I really clear on what I would coach to? Do I really know what this person needs as skills? Have I identified that they're poor on margins, that they give in a little too easily, that they develop a rapport in the beginning of, with, the, with the client, but soon they don't develop the relationship? All those very specific things that will allow you to coach and coach effectively. Uh, start out the superfluous and identify uh, the hard hits, which is basically what I've been talking about with who do you spend your time with. The other element is feedback. Okay, you've set up your sales indicators, uh, you've done the planning, you've developed the expectations and aspirations. You're working with the individual, whether you're going along on sales calls with them or you're working just through them as you pass them and you're doing something. Coaching in the moment, we might call that. 
but you're doing all of that. How do you give feedback? Well, feedback is meant one, to do one of two things. It's either meant to reinforce good behavior or redirect ineffective behavior, one of those two. And if you're redirecting it, you can't redirect it without taking something and putting it in place of something else. So if you're redirecting it, you have to not only give guidance, but you have to put the salesperson in a position uh, to practice the skill and to uh, and, and for more feedback. Uh, if the person is, is again, poor in negotiating, poor in margins, then you have to be with the person to observe whether or not that's improving. Coach afterwards. Uh, we would always suggest when you do coach to make sure you listen to the other person before you give your views. That's sort of a psychological associates thing that we really think is important. The objectives of feedback to strengthen performance, provide focus, get genuine commitment, demonstrate support, enhance the caliber of your relationship. Reinforcing, redirecting. It says here, when performance is at or above the standard, what is implied there? There's something missing in that slide, too. Is up to or above the standard, then you reinforce. Redirect when performance is below the standard. Do you have a standard? What's the standard? If you're going to coach to something, what's the standard? When can you say the person's going to be improved? Those are things for you to work out in your planning also. When does it mean the person is negotiating well? Is it a strong feeling that you have? Is it you're using your experience and but you have a, don't have it defined? The more you define things, the better off you are. The, he says there, use you statements to stress ownership, and this gets into the motivational and stress, uh, uh, stress uh, I statements for reindirecting. So give the person credit by saying, you did a great job when we were on that call. I noticed that you did this, this, and this, and I just want to uh, acclaim and, and reinforce what, that, that I think you did a great job. The redirecting, on the other hand, says, I feel that um, um, we aren't going to make our numbers if we give up margins that way. That's an I statement. It brings you into it. It tells you how you feel. It's not talking about the other person. And it's a way of dealing from a motivational level and for somewhat diffusing any kind of emotional element that comes with the approach. Okay, before I get into behavior, which all, which is basically our forte, uh, are there any questions with what I've stated? And to give a quick summary, which I've done a couple of times. Number one, make sure that you have sales indicators in place before you do any coaching. Make sure that you put those sales indicators, those skills that you're coaching to, across a coaching continuum based on beginner to expert levels. Number three, make sure that you've sat down and clear, clarified expectations and aspirations and that there is agreement on what those indicators are and where the person needs to go. That will vary according to where the person is on the continuum. It's the only way you're going to have true observation. The only way you can give objective feedback is to have clear observables. If you don't have that, you can't do that. Are there any questions with, uh, with these points up to now? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Jay, you seem to be in deep thought. Does it make sense? Okay. I like how you uh, reiterated looking at the market after you have put 
and your indicators in place? Because a lot of times the indicators are there, but your markets change. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of times you forget to adapt your indicators with that. Right. That's absolutely true. We, we talk about the competencies on a management level, and it's interesting how I was up at Brookstone with one of our uh, consultants uh, in New Hampshire, and they had some competencies in place that allowed them to focus and hire some people. Uh, they hired to the competencies. But then <coughs> their profile of where they were going changed. So did some of the competencies change. They went back to look at the people they didn't hire to see if they would be hired based on the new competencies. Just to give you an idea of how things change. So they came up with some insights. Yes, they would have hired some of the people. <coughs> Behavior. Uh, when you coach, you're going to have some resistance to change, <coughs> especially with plateau performers. Plateau performers might be indignant. You're saying that I'm not doing a job, I'm the best performer you have. So that discussion can't be. The question becomes, well, how do you deal with, with resistance? And we deal with it with the behavioral model. And of course, that's uh, dealing with what John already established the idea of high results and relationships and the idea that if you're with when you're working with your people you're too high on task and not sensitive to where they're coming from from a motivational standpoint you're especially with your plateau performance not all of them are going to be driven at that point by intangible rewards that may shock people in sales but that's the case i mean by tangible rewards because there may be some intangible at this stage in their life, they may need something else to really be motivated to go further. The old idea of tangible esteem needs might not be as great as these this idea of independence and you know, and uh, self-realization needs. Getting back to Maslow, and as a result, you have to make sure that you're dealing with them in a way that allows them to express those needs. For those that are unfamiliar with the model, very quickly, we have four quadrants. The two going up this way, the further you go up that way, the more task-oriented you are. The more you go to the right, the more relationship you are. The balance would, would rest in Q4, where you balance the task, which is we've got to get the job done. Uh, the quota is important. You have, you, you, the idea of putting sales indicators in means that we're trying to meet those sales indicators. They're in alignment with the aspirations of the company. And then on the other hand, what is it that excites you? What are those issues that are personal that are driving you? Not only the, the organization, because we have a marriage here between you and this organization. How can we make that marriage successful? <coughs> Action causes interaction. Whatever, it's caused causality. Whatever happens causes a result. And that's true with behavior as well. As well. If you are very task driven, esteem driven, as the Q1 that was on that uh, model stated, then very often a coach that is that way will get behavior that comes back that is submissive, or that is too uh, uh, affirming, too agreeing. And as a result, the Q1 behavior is driving the other behavior. The Q2 behavior, if a coach is very selective on what they share with their person they're coaching, a little ambiguous in regard to expectations, sort of leaves the person alone to develop on their own. And very often you'll get one or two behaviors in return. You'll get a behavior that's sort of aggressive and may go off in any direction, uh, may take control, may go off in directions that are not in alignment with the organization. And then it might also result in Q2 behavior, which means that the person doesn't share with you what needs to be shared with you as a sales manager or sales coach. And then finally, if you show Q3 behavior, 
the, your answer to everything is to go out and have a cocktail with the uh, person or meet on the golf range and always tell them how well they're doing. And the result generally is Q1 behavior because they don't feel anything's getting done, they're not improving. So that can be a backlash. Or Q3 behavior, which means that you'll both be out on the golf course at a cocktail hour and nothing will be getting done. So behavior begets behavior. The interaction is very, very important. Joe? Yes. On all three of those, the behavior part, those are all not what we believe, but what the person we're coaching believes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's what like we have here is, is you is, one, two, three, or four with five different people. In your office. You can be that way with different people, yes. You can your 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 Are behavior would change. <coughs> now of course we're advocating one certain behavior. What what behavior is that? We already talked about Q4 Q4 behavior. We're saying that you need to balance. You need to be uh, objective, analytical, observant, <coughs> compassionate, perfect person. Now that's the ideal, but there there are specifics that behavioral descriptors that you can look at. That, will, that you can identify with and become better with. When we're coaching, we try to do that. And vice versa, which means that you go the other way too. The direct reports behavior can cause the coach to react in, in, in those ways. I mean, you have a choice. If the, your salesperson is not giving you information, and that's always a problem. Do the, does the salesperson, the sales manager, sales coach have the information so that they can do their duties to the organization? Uh, do they have that information? And is it being supplied by the frontline person and salesperson? And if it's not, then the coach, of course, can take on a certain behaviors, some of them very deleterious to their uh, effort. become aggressive and demanding and be very task oriented and of course that may react when the person still not giving it. Uh, becoming even more Q2, digging further deep in the, into the earth and hiding and not collaborating. Developmental methods uh, for coaching if you have uh, some salespeople that need it, or any of the above. Okay. Let me summarize again. And that is, what's the first thing that you need to be an effective coach? Who can tell me? Indicators. You have to have defined the indicators, and you have to have defined those indicators in relationship to where the person is on the skill continuum, and what the aspirations of the organization and the aspirations of the salesperson. What's the next thing that you need to assess? What do you need to assess if you have the sales indicator? Where they fall on the coaching continuum. How do you align those sales indicators where, where they are from a beginner to an intermediate to an expert? Thirdly, once you've got those laid out, you know when you work with the person that you're going to confront resistance. Part of the resistance, and, and one of the things that's very important is that you give feedback. Productive feedback, even productive disagreement is very critical to good coaching. So the idea of making sure you set a standard for the feedback, the criteria of the feedback, according to the indicators, making sure you understand when the person needs to be redirected or reinforced in regard to feedback. And then finally, look deep into the behavior of the individuals to be able to predict the motivation element, discuss motivation with the person. Is it tangible or intangible that's driving the person? And how can you work with them on this dimension 
to develop this connection. Okay, John. Thank you. Um, hopefully today we've, we've given you some thought triggers, some things to consider uh, as to what plateauing is all about, what coaching is all about, and some actions that you might be able to take in that respect. Um, we also like to give you some opportunity for some, uh, some questions or comments or thoughts that you have for us that we, that we have been able to address uh, during the session itself. So if there are particular situations that you have or our thoughts that we've covered that you'd like for us to expand on. Great. Um, we said earlier that uh, as a means of saying thank you to you that we were going to have a drawing for one of our uh, seminars, potential selling <coughs> seminars. We have, I believe we have everyone's either their business card or their name in here. Am I correct? Has anyone not put their business card in here? Okay, we have a drawing. This is for a free seat for our upcoming dimensional selling workshop, which is uh, June 10th through the 13th. And, uh, Jennifer, thanks. Mother to be. Not sure to that. Who is that? Joseph Grimm. Joseph, congratulations. Thank you. Would you mind passing this down to Joe? Thanks. We really appreciate your coming out uh, and joining us today. Um, we would like for you to give us some thoughts as to uh, your questions of the briefing, what you got out of it, what you'd like to see coming from it, changes in upcoming briefings, and action plans if you'd like for us to talk to you a bit more about what we work with. Uh, some of the things that we talked about today are actually spin-outs from our coaching workshop. In fact, when you leave, there's a basket back there for you to drop your uh, feedback sheets in. In exchange, we like to give you kind of a takeaway. It's a pocket card which summarizes some of the coaching tips that Joe was highlighting during his part of the presentation. With that, we thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in the future. And uh, again, if we will be here, if you'd like to have some questions or if there's things we can add to help for you. Thank you very much.